Hi, marketers. Welcome to another episode of the Marketing Maverick Show. My name is Chris. Hi, I'm Asim. And today we're joined by two guests, Ryan and Paul from Growth Studio. Uh, Growth Studio is a consultancy that helps companies scale uh, using the tactics of high growth startups. And we got the chance to work a bit with Growth Studio and with, with uh, both Ryan and Paul. And we are super excited to have a chat today about growth hacking and the growth hacking mindset, what we can learn from it and what startups can learn from it and looking at the best in both startups and corporates and a lot around that sort of topic. Um, just to give you a bit more background, Growth Studio worked with over 200 startups worldwide, um, including um, globally, including the US and also including Middle East like Dubai. And yeah, we're really excited to have you both on the show. So welcome, welcome to you. Thank you, for, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Super happy to be here. Very cool. I think it's, okay. fair, I think it's fair to say that we've worked on probably the most niche technologies and startups <laughs> on earth with Wasim and Chris. Yes, we'll, I think we'll come to that. Um, firstly, Wasim, you wanted to give a little bit of a story of how you got to know um, Rayan. Yeah, it's a funny one because um, I actually was on a job fair um, in the Silicon Roundabout, Milk Roundabout thing. And I remember meeting Ryan there. And I was actually applying for a job. <laughs> and Ryan was like, um, I think part of True Up at that point. And, uh, I w sorry? He didn't get the job. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get the job. I'm thankful I didn't get the job. <laughs> so, but I think it's important to kind of, I wanted to share the story only because it's like opportunities like this where you like meet people and then suddenly like after two years we were working together um i think there was another person Sadika, and she was like the common person who introduced us uh, but then when people ask me like how do you get lucky and luck you define your luck because you create opportunities by meeting people and if you're not at the right place at the right time then how else would you meet people? So I think thanks to that one little kind of maybe interaction, uh, it has you paved the way. <laughs> Sorry? You met me. <laughs> yeah, and then we met, we met Paul. I think that's one of my questions there. How did you guys meet? Well, before we, before we come on to that, let, let me quickly just, uh, if I can just follow that on. So um, I, I remember that day very clearly. And I remember that day because I got along well with you. Uh, I remember that day because um, you were top of my list for people I want to meet after the job fair. Uh, but you were also uh, probably the most experienced um, and tactical marketer that we had met that day. Uh, and that that's really the reason why, I mean, look, you didn't get the job, but that's the reason why you didn't get the job. But that's also the reason why I, like, we kept in contact. Yeah. I think we, we both knew at some point this is, this is going to be, um, we're going to end up working together in some way, somehow. And the industry's small, right? The growth hacking world was tiny. The growth world is tiny. So we knew we'd yeah, be, yeah. we kind of uh, bump into each other and we did so via a mutual client slash friend. Yeah. Um, and then I guess uh, the, way I, the way I see it is that we grew our businesses kind of together. But how did Paul and I meet? That's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting one. So Paul and I used to work together. Uh, well, we used to work in the same place. Mm. at a marketing agency in central London. Uh, I'd never worked with Paul, never really spoke. We never really ever even said hello. I don't even think we were, we shared the lift together, to be honest. I don't like, um, but I knew of Paul. Paul knew of me. Um, I was always, I all, I think I always felt like a bit of a rebel. I think I was, I, I was always the one who kind of said, well, should we be doing that? Can we not be doing something else? And I kind of heard, someone at some point say that I was quite similar to Paul to the, and I, and I knew who Paul was. I knew his face and I knew, anyway, that, that was, I kept that in mind, never thought anything of it. Um, we added each other onto Facebook as you do, you know, you add your colleagues onto Facebook and, um, we disagreed on everything, right? So, you know, <laughs> on, on Facebook, you, you talk about uh, like society and politics and, uh religion and spirituality and funny stuff and everything like everything yeah so our mutual friends were later told us that they would have they when they wanted to post something on facebook they would worry because it might start spark a, an online discussion between paul and ryan but uh, anyway I, I still get facebook memories asked, i still get facebook memories come up and it's like ryan will have put something up about jeremy corbyn or something inconsequential politically somewhere and it's like 
Ryan made this comment like eight years ago, 67 comments, which is basically Ryan and I like fighting at each other continuously. Um, uh, so many, many years passed. Um, our careers moved in different directions. Uh, I was, definitely was going to launch my own business. That was always going to happen. And I did. So I launched um, Growth Studio uh, and Growth Studio did really well for the first year. And it was... Um, uh, I knew that to take it to the next level, I needed I needed the yin to my yang. Basically, I needed someone who, who's got the other, who's got who's well, who's smarter than me for a start, as you could probably, probably tell. In terms of maybe not as better looking, but um, smarter than me, but also can can do the things that I neither wanted to do nor ha had the skills to do. Um, and so I started meeting everyone. So I started speaking to everyone, uh, everyone I'd ever kind of come across who thought it might be interesting. And at the time, growth hacking was a really hard to explain concept, uh, especially sort of the version that I wanted to push into the market was really tough to articulate. So I sat down with Paul. We met uh, we met in um, the Riding House Cafe in central London, and I just showed me a few diagrams and it explained what it is that I wanted to do. And I want and just to get his thoughts. And um, he just said all the right things. And I was like, OK, from that point forward, I just um, I, I, I think I stalked him. I was talking to a point where I even sh shifted my desk. Like we had this desk size for one, right? And in, in my office space, I even kind of budged myself up. So I, I and told him, look, you've got a desk space here. Just come and work. With you, right? So like, and he did for a few days. And I think, it, Paul, do you want to pick up the story from there? Yeah. I mean, for, for me, um, having, having worked in marketing and advertising for many, many years, um, I always knew morally there was something wrong in the big agency approach of, huge budgets of um, getting big splashes, but not being effectiveness. And I was always a product of a Catholic mother, but very conscious about spending anybody's mother and anybody's money, sorry. Um, and agencies just, they just didn't have their client's interest at heart. They never had the numbers. They, you know, people didn't think commercially, although they're very creative. Creatively, they weren't creative uh, commercially. And I was working at a car crash of an agency. I was on my way out of the out of, out of the industry completely. I remember Ryan showing me this this spreadsheet that he'd made of just it was just numbers, the campaign numbers. And you know, if we switch off some of these ads, we switch on these on this is the ROI. This is how it works. And it might be some rudimentary stuff in um, in growth hacking circles, but over here it's fundamentally different mindset. It's how do we use a client's money to really create an ROI and look at the different areas of the funnel. And I just got it immediately i was like this is this is where every single agency has been going wrong for the past few years um and yes we we, we kept talking we i think i was um i was interviewing for a job long story short we ended up going in and pitching some work for a, a travel startup we won it and then we're like oh maybe maybe we're onto something and a few years later here we are great yeah okay <laughs> probably a bit longer than you wanted <laughs> That's a good story. Um, so gross hacking, obviously, um, is the industry you entered. And in some way, I think back in the day, it was a term no one really heard about. Uh, 2016, 15, 16, I assume you got into this. Um, how did you come across gross hacking as such? Um, because, I mean, today it is very popular. Um, but how did you come across it at that time? And how is it different today? So gross hacking at the time was 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 hugely i mean it was it was it was a it was a buzzword that was getting a lot of buzz around it and it meant a lot of different things to a lot of people i mean look even now right you look at you look up growth hacking it could mean anything from you know like really cheesy pop-up type marketing right or uh or click bad marketing all the way through to like you know and you know sean ellis's definition needs a lot more uh understanding to what but his definition was, you know, someone who's true, um, uh, true north is growth or something along those lines. There's something quite sort of um, that needs more, more detail. It could mean anything in between that. But um, I was introduced to growth hacking by um, my old boss and colleague uh, who introduced me to the concept. And I think at the time he wasn't sure what growth hacking really was himself, um, but he, he had a grasp of it. Like he knew there was something in here that we that that the world should be doing, um, my, because my skills were in data. I'm, I'm fundamentally a data strategist. Then I was able to kind of look at those concepts and kind of go, okay, well, look, I think data is really about the focus on conversion rates throughout the funnel and not 
the numbers throughout the funnel. And that's really the, def the I think, the best definition of growth hacking from a marketing point of view. So let me give you an example. Let me give you a situation and let's see how a marketer would deal with it versus a growth hacker would deal with it, right? So you've got a funnel of, let's say I'm selling wisdom jigs, right, online. I'm selling these wisdom jigs online. And I'm getting a good ROI on my marketing. I'm getting a good ROI to drive people to my website. Good uh, number of people who go on to purchase uh, my, my wisdom jig. What would a marketer do at this stage if they want to increase the revenue? They'll throw some more money at it. Now, I mean, look, that, but that would be a very fair thing to do, right? You kind of go, look, everything's working. Let's just pump more money in yeah. and skip. See, a growth hacker wouldn't do that. A growth hacker would say, okay, like, how do we make more money? Well, let me see if I can increase the conversion rates between each of those stages of the journey. So whilst a marketer has a really important role, and that's to basically keep the sales coming in, the growth hacker has a role of taking that exact same scenario and just making it work even harder. And that's the core difference. With that comes some skills that everyone would need to have. One is the understanding of data and how to basically read the funnel and read the numbers. Um, and also with that, you, might, you, you need to be able, be able to ask the question, okay, well, how do we actually kind of make this work better? And so with that comes tactics and creative thinking and the ability to kind of create creative solutions that can be within tech or maybe not even tech. It can be in or out, in or inside or outside of tech, but think of creative solutions. And that's why you start to see really interesting things happening within the growth hacking world using APIs and um, even things like pop-ups, right? It come from that level of creative thinking. Um, I think when we first started, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. No. I, I think when we first started as well, um, particularly in the startup scene in, in the UK, people knew about growth hacking. They knew it was a thing that had been going on in America, but they just didn't know how to apply it or, or how to use some of the fundamentals. Um, and what we found is for earlier stage startups, um, they were interested, but they didn't have the data. They didn't quite have product market fit. And what we found for corporates as well, which is the world that, that um, Ryan had managed to escape a couple of years before and I was still um, licking my war wounds, was that, Every, every single corporate that did marketing who could fundamentally make a massive difference to their business was looking at their numbers and their data from a very disintegrated perspective. So you have marketing teams that would be split into CRM, into online, into media, and no one is really looking at that funnel holistically and trying to work out how people get in from the start of the funnel down to the bottom. And some of the work we've done with corporates is just try and match up not only the thinking but the data so that people can really understand what they're trying to do and how they can shift it and that was that was a really new concept back in the day i know that a few people had tried we've worked with one or two media agencies back in you know in the past who wanted to at least try and ensure that any click throughs they could see what page they were going through to but that's kind of where it's at. i think the uk is very far behind the us say in terms of that growth hacking mindset and that integrated thinking yeah very much so <clears throat> so, and, I think just, and with working with startups, I think this is where we start to get some incredible results. Um, mm. If I'm truly honest with myself and with Paul, I don't think we could expect the results that we were really getting ourselves. I mean, it, it, the methodology worked. And because of our, wor our work in the corporate world, in the agency world, um, everyone started paying attention. And that's really how um, uh, yeah, we, we started to kind of get more and more prominence in the right spaces. So. So what would you say, for example, if there's a client who's got a fixed budget of, let's say, £10,000 to spend every month, would you tell them, let's hold on and let's come up with the more optimized way of using the budget? Or they, they I mean, from their brief, they want to spend it. Would you control that spending? I think the, the first one for me is look at really nails down what the brief is and what the expectation is that money why are they spending it what objectives they're trying to um, hit what are the kpis and then look at the sales funnel behind that and see what see what power it because a lot of times um especially for the the smes and the, the big companies we work with the go-to thought initially is more media more creative more advertising when actually you can make a much bigger difference to the bottom line and profitability on some of your attention on your CRM on fixing some fundamental problems with the bottom of the funnel. Um, and so the first one is to work out one, 
what your objective is to what that funnel is and and where you can optimize that funnel because sometimes a little bit of money to to undo or un, uh, unbreak a pain point in the journey has a much bigger impact. When you've got that, then you can start to focus where that money should go. That'd be my, yeah. my one. No, absolutely. You know, look, I think like we, we have to take a pragmatic view on how to run a business because that's the most important thing, right? Growth hacking is just part like, and I think this is where a lot of other quote unquote growth hackers or growth marketers kind of go a bit wrong where they go over the top in what they need to do. Like, so I, we normally apply the 80, 20 rule. Sometimes it's the, um, the, you know, the 72, 28 rule. It could be, it could vary like that. Right. So it could, um, but it's, it's a portion, a portion of the money should really be allocated towards experimentation, test, test your hypothesis. The remainder has to go to kind of, um, maintaining your sales and growing your sales based on previous experimentation mm. so that, that like you can spend 80 percent of your budget and get more value and more sales and more roi from that 80 percent if you were to spend the other 20 percent in ensuring that to happen through experimentation so um and it's a scary thought especially for startups right this is a very scary thought for startups because it's like well yeah, ten thousand pounds isn't too much it's not that much money Believe me, it's just as much of a scary thought for corporates because, oh, it's something new. We've never done it before. Like, how should we do it? So wherever you look across the company maturity spectrum, it's a scary thing to do. But the more this becomes business as usual, where a portion of your marketing budget is always allocated towards experimentation marketing, the more it just becomes part and parcel of everyday business activity. And that's really where businesses still haven't really got to and need to get to. There are two caveats on that. One is that... Um it's pointless spending money unless you know exactly where that money is going. So you need to make sure you've got the data and everything is lined up so you can understand what the drop-off points are, what works, what doesn't, um, which customers um, are going to be spending the more money over time versus ones that will just flirt with you by once and, and go away. So you've got to have that data lined up and synced up. Three caveats. The second one, as Ryan says, you've got to be pragmatic. It's pointless wasting your time on something that um, will make a marginal gain. And the third one is, and I, I didn't take my own advice recently and uh, paid the price for it, but you need to go back and continuously talk to customers. You need to make sure that you, you can make marginal gains. You can improve your conversion rates by two, three, five, ten percent 10%. But if you go back and talk to a customer and just take them through the user journey, sometimes the feedback that they get or they give you the nuggets of insight, um, the, the pain points that they've realized that you haven't done will we'll give you the 30, 40, 50% uplift in conversion rate. So before anything, go back, test everything, speak to customers, make sure you're closer to getting product market fit and then start to work out the objectives and then spend the money. Okay. What I found really interesting is like how you compared the growth hacker versus the marketer mindset. And um, when I compare, let's say, I would see myself as a marketer mainly, um, obviously with the aim to grow and to grow stack as well, but let's say, let's, let's pick the channel of search engine optimization, SEO. If I compare 2016 to today, still, it's more or less the same, the fundamentals. Would you say that also applies to growth hacking or how much do the tactics that worked in 2016 still work today? Okay. So that, that's, that's a very good question. First of all, let me address the issue of you being more of a marketer than a, a growth hacker. Right. So you're one of these special breeds of like new age marketer, right, which is where the entire industry is going. And I think this is why uh, we work together so well, where like the 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 concept of growth hacking is and concept of marketer is quite rightly blending together. So marketers are adopting the growth hacker mindset because the reality is, is the expectations of a marketer is is. It's just kind of turning into well, you should be optimizing the funnel anyway. That's it, becoming more established. You, you're a, you're definitely a few steps ahead in your thinking. So arguably, you're definitely a growth hacker who has the yeah. marketing skills, or you're a marketer who has the growth hacking skills. So that, that's 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 that there. Now the question was really about is has the the basic principles of growth hacking changed over time? Um, you can break growth hacking down into two layers: the strategic layer and the tactical layer. Strategic layer remains exactly the same. Understand what's happening uh, with data. Identify the weakest points in your conversion journey. Experiment with, or understand from your customers why that could be happening. Experiment in ways that we can improve that. And then fundamentally test. 
If it works, roll it out across the entire marketing strategy. That's your strategic level, right? That has not changed at all. I don't see that changing very, very much at all. That because they're, 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 they're based around principles. What's changed? The layer above that, the, ta the tactical layer, the tactics of how you actually, you know, what do you actually implement to drive a change in behavior in your market? That's changing all the time. So um, pop-ups, uh, I keep referring to pop-ups, you know, remarketing strategies, um, being able to connect different APIs and uh, give people a different journey, changing words and colors. You know, these this all comes from uh, the uh, availability of current technology and current tools, but also how the how creative the growth hacker actually is in their in their way of thinking and their mindset. And that's that's something that's never going to be automatable. Right. So if, if the four of us are growth hackers, and we all start to use the same tactic, eventually that tactic no longer becomes useful, right? We all need to kind of keep on thinking about new and different ways of, of being able to drive that increase in conversion. And that's always changing, quite yeah. right. I, I think for me, um, when we assess and work with a business, we look at growth hacking from a business perspective, from marketing through to operations, through to you know, the resource, through to everybody and look at what are going to be the biggest influences to grow that business. And sometimes it's not marketing at all. I think I imagine a lot of people will be wanting to listen to this podcast, trying to focus on more of the tactics than they can apply, which is possibly why we're, we're focusing a bit more on the marketing tactics. I think two other things for me is I think the, the mindset hasn't necessarily evolved too much for growth hacking since 2016. I think it's people are it's becoming a lot more adopted, which is a good thing. I think you know, the, the tools you can play with now for growth hackers have definitely evolved. There's a, a lot more tools, APIs, gadgets, wizard, wizard do that you can um, make your life easier. I think, and I don't know if it's just me because I'm immersed with it and happy for years, but it feels a lot of the tactics, I certainly get growth hacking fatigue when I'm going onto new technology sites and I can see all of the, the same pop-ups, the hello bars, the, you know, the tactics they've used, the, the persuaders. I'm, um, I've certainly, got fatigue from it but i know i'm a lot more critically assessing websites when i go on them and, and and user journeys and i wonder whether or not that's the same with with consumers and businesses whether they've become a bit more wizened to some of the tactics that people are using to try and get them to um to, to hook them in um saying that um as you all know uh, with seam and ryan especially um four sigmata four sigmatic coffee um with someone i've come across recently <laughs> Um, I've been telling Wasim about it daily for the past three months. I think they're one example of a consumer product. It's mushroom coffee that have just really beautifully um, taken all of the growth marketing tactics and applied it to that beautiful, wonderful site. I still haven't bought anything yet, but I'm telling everyone about them. Uh, check it out. It's a it's a great example of growth hacking in in, in progress. Yeah, we are not being paid for this promotion. Just so you know. <laughs> no. <laughs> we'll put in unless they'd like to, in which case. Uh, you know how to contact yeah. us. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely share the link with the, in our um, in our links. Um, I have a question more about the current world, the current scenario of different. We agencies. all do, Wasi. We Sorry. all do. <laughs> the agency world right now, which is kind of focused on doing Facebook ads, Google ads, all these different types of pop-up agencies, um, and they're still kind of sometimes charging time for money. How do you work out the price for this kind of work? Because what you're doing can be so impactful that it could literally change somebody's ad spend or their return of investment or their their cost per ac or for acquisition. So what? how would you price it? And what would be your recommendation to someone who's currently like thinking of growth hacking as their as they maybe as a freelance business or actual as an agency business? Mm, good question. Paul, do you want to take this? So, yeah, so sorry, just so I'm really clear on the question, is that how would you assess whether to get someone in and how they charge, or if you're a growth hacker, how would you charge? Yes, uh, how would you charge as a growth hacker if you were to make these changes? Would you price by hour, price, price by project, or price by the return of the value? It's really difficult. I think um, the, the, the challenges with pricing models is people like stability, especially for younger businesses, I think, where every single penny or cent matters a lot more than a big corporate. Um, I would say that if you're starting a, if you're, if you're being true to your growth hacking credentials and you're um, being true to your client, I'd always start off with a project because 
inevitably you need a lot of time to set up the fundamentals you need time to make sure that everything is matched up you've got the data they've got the right tools that things make sense from a outsider's perspective and i don't think that's what you can scrimp on so what what we tend to do ourselves or what we say to other growth hackers is do an interim project where you set up the foundations and there'll always be quick wins there'll always be things that you can give to your clients you can always add much more value than you're charging for but start with a small project because you can be the best growth hacker in the world but if your client can't move as fast as you can or if they're being resistant to experimenting or you know, paying for the tools that you want to or changing the position of your product then you're always going to be doomed to fail and a lot of times when that happens you end up just being a run-of-the-mill facebook advertiser so hmm. always start off with a project have some really clear um, objectives for what you're going to do at that time and i think once you start to um, get to know the client how the client operates what the numbers are i think it's always really good to have some form of success fee because that motivates everybody um, and it also shows that you want to be ambitious but i think invariably you're selling your expertise, you're selling your time, and you might be charging two days of your time a month or 10 days or 15 days, but actually that's probably taken five years or 10 years worth of really hard graph to get to the expertise that you've got. So mm. um, it, it's a really difficult question. You, you take it case by case, but I think that for growth hackers, you always need that foundational first project to work out whether or not you can both work with each other. Yeah, and I think I think when it comes to the world of startups, that's how we normally do things, right? Or I say startups, scale ups is how we normally work with. Um, so I think the very first thing is make sure you only work on projects that you know you can be successful on, right? So you need to basically uh, work on projects that you that you know you can make a real difference. And if you can make a real difference, then step one is to put your money where your mouth is, charge on time and materials, charge on TNM, right, for, for a small project to prove the value on the basis and on the understanding that you will then you can you will then kind of reassess a longer term commitment but really the 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 ideal way of of pricing for growth hacking is to really uh charge on a percentage of the uplift of the roi right so how much additional money did you make that company not how many additional leads did you get or how many additional but what is the uplift in sales that you uh, that occurred as a result of your efforts and charge a percentage of that so run that interim project charge based on days right everybody knows that model no one really likes it but everyone does it anyway it kind of works although it doesn't but it's just the way it's done right show what you can do and then watch people if you if you're successful, then watch people kind of be totally okay with what you're charging them because they they it's still very predictable as to what they'll be uh, spending because it's just going to be a uh, percentage of what they're earning. That being said, that works really well for some clients, the, um, start scale up clients, uh, etc. But for the world of corporates, world of agencies, you know, Paul and I, we still find ourselves charging time and materials, and it becomes quite tricky because. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't, I don't, as a, as a, someone who's naturally curious and naturally wants to kind of, uh, you know, get my hat, get, get my, get stuck into the, the nitty gritty of marketing. I don't want to be time limited either. Right? I don't want to be basically say, I've only got two days to turn something around. I've got to divide that two day, two days up over the week. And that's just not the right way for anyone to do this. Right. But, um, we know we, we find ourselves having to align with the way that corporates work or the way that, that, uh, agencies work and when that happens I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis so yeah. I think the, the biggest watch out for this is that the minute someone's in the mindset to get a growth hacker on board to their company or business you know that they're a different type of thinker that they should hopefully be a bit more commercially creative there is a huge caveat I'd say less than two percent one and a half percent of the companies that we've worked with and and Chris it's probably nearer to about 300 350 now startups that we've worked with and say less than one and a half, two percent actually know their numbers. They don't actually know the leads that they get in. They don't know what their profitability is on products. They don't know the conversion rates. They don't know how much they sell. People genuinely have a blindness when they come to their own business. And so before you, you talk about any form of promises on uplift, you need to know the numbers. You need to know that predictability. And I think um, the way we'd always approach a client or, or tell people to approach a new project is first get a grip of the numbers because invariably they will be surprised how bad then or how good their numbers are and what the opportunities are i think a decent growth hack and we've seen this a lot will we'll go actually you don't need me you need to focus up your 
you know your call center or or people over here and some of the work we've got is is off the back of us telling people 20 30 times that they shouldn't pay for us and they don't need us and they need to sort other stuff out um, so first look at the numbers and then you can start to, to talk about uplift and predictability mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the point you made with blindness is super important. And I can definitely also share that um, with us in our example. What happens is working together with Seema and me, we help each other very often just to find areas that we would miss ourselves. And I can give you tons of examples on that. And then to have someone coming completely from the outside, I can see that value very much. Like you guys coming in and giving, uh, helping a corporate accelerate their growth and obviously the benefits of let's say working with corporates and teaching them or working with them in adopting startup skills that makes a lot of sense but is there something which startups can learn from corporates as well specifically i think i i think so and if i may can i just can i quickly drop in two examples of the blindness that, that came up just whilst yes. you're asking the questions and invariably i need to get you to re-ask the question in about a minute when i've forgotten it but um, we were working with a corporate client when we first started started off, and they're they're a huge, huge behemoth uh, global British company. And one of the people we were working with was trying to get a business case for twenty or twenty two thousand pounds to fix a web page on an internal process. Now this company employs literally hundreds of thousands of people, and this, this internal web page was a a key part of something that everyone had to do. And they kept on struggling for the business case because all they wanted to do was fix this web page. And we ended up working with them and we looked at how many people use this web page, what the process was. We timed four or five people using this process to, to fix this web page. And for about 18 months, they hadn't got this budget of 22K, which is nothing. They would literally make that in a second um, in one of their uh, premises on a daily basis. We worked out that the performance and the pain that this one page was causing the company was something like 580,000 pounds every single year. And so they were refusing to spend 22,000 pounds to fix this 580,000 pounds per year black hole that they hadn't been aware of. And when we gave them the numbers, um, it was it was like one of those dramatic TV moments where people were like, holy shit, like how how is this happening? And if you amplify that by a company of three or four hundred thousand people and all of the processes they've got, you suddenly realize quite how many how much money has been wasted. The second one was a um, crowdfunding campaign strategy that we worked on with people. And they came to us and they had quite a clear idea of what their product the benefits of the product. They didn't really know about who would want it. We helped them with that, but their pricing strategy. Um, and they were they had a very clear view of how much they wanted to charge their pricing strategy. When we actually did the math and looked at you know, postage, uh, profit, uh, um, storage, everything else. It was going to cost them something like one or two dollars for every single product they sold. And they were hoping to sell tens of thousands of products. So people have inherent blindness in their numbers, but no one really looks at it. So take the step back and calculate everything first. And lastly, I completely forgot your question, which I knew that I would. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Don't I'll worry. It, yes. but, uh, the question was a good one. It's like, look, corporates have a lot to learn from startups and that's kept us in business for, you know, and fortunately we'll, we'll do, but do the startups have anything to learn, to learn from corporates? And the answer is, look, the, the biggest thing a startup can learn from a corporate is just how a corporate works. Like the amount of startups that we have worked with who are trying to sell into an organization that they have absolutely no idea about how the structures work, how the logistics processes work, how procurement works, um, how their technology will, will be fitting into the, the wider uh, product portfolio. They've got absolutely no idea and in fact some of the you know a lot of the startups we worked with have probably never worked in a corporate ever so they've got no idea about even the social side of of the, the politics and the um the decision making structure so startups have got and startups have got a lot to learn from corporates um and the reality is is that they need to learn this because the corporate is what's going to fundamentally make or break their business, right? The being able, to, if you're a B2B startup in particular, um, you need to know this if you want to succeed. You need to know this in order to kind of carve not just your product, but the, that commercial wrapper around your product. So it has basically business model fit within the, uh, within the corporate. That's the biggest thing a uh, startup can learn. And I think the, the way to really learn this in its fullest form is 
either having worked within a corporate for a few years, so you, you really understand the, the, the nitty gritty of it, right, of, of, of that environment, or it, failing that, um, bring someone on board who has worked in a corporate. You need to have that insider knowledge. You know, to, to give you an example, when we think about entrepreneur, right, the, it, the view that we get in our head is a, it's a very Chris Lear type character, right? Young, charismatic, you know, wearing a shirt and a um, little bit smarmy. Chris, I'm only joking, but uh, you know, but that, that's the character, that's the view we have in our head. But the reality is, is su- the most successful founders are those who are mid to late thirties who've come with a few years experience and upon which they've based a new product or new idea that's the most successful startups that we're seeing so um we see we see that in our experience and i think that's there's some industry there's, there's many industry terms to to kind of support industry stats to support that um so yeah so that would be uh, what a startup can learn from a corporate i i agree with all of that obviously um because we're always completely aligned um i would attack the question from a slightly different perspective i think um Caveat being, I'm, I'm yet to, to, to come across a really well-oiled uh, process um, optimized corporate, but I think corporates are very good at accountability and making sure that you know, there's someone looking at um, where the money is spent. They're quite good at process in terms of when A happens, where's B, where's C, how do you, how do you line up that process? They're very good at forecasting and um, having just spent the morning doing yeah, forecast up till December 2021 for one of our clients. Um, they're quite good at working out what the runway is, how that money needs to be spent out, what's the different PL or, or, or budget types for each of those pennies. And I think some of that rigor and some of the more boring stuff that startups tend to ignore, they'd work very well at. And the final one that we, um, I think, have definitely come from the corporate world. Um, I'm not sure how, I'm not sure why, but we've applied to startups is just what are your KPIs and how do you focus on them? And although KPIs are so inherently driven in, in you know, the growth hacking world, so few startups actually have really clearly defined KPIs for either their products, for their investors, for their growth, or they stick to it. And, they, and I think as anyone that's worked with corporates and have to do you know, weekly reporting, um, those KPIs matter. That's one, those, those are the learnings I'd bring from the corporate yeah. world. Mm. I think that's very, very insightful. And I remember like this conversation with Ryan uh, in 2015, and he asked me this question: um, "How's your data looking?" And I went because we, I was focused more on the landing pages. I didn't care too much about the ad quality and the traffic. And that sparked that um, almost like the impetus for setting up dashboards. And since then, for every little thing I can think of, I have a dashboard. Um, and coming back to dashboards and KPIs. What are the first few metrics would you say every startup should have so that I can swear on them and <laughs> really can hone on them? Okay, so look, you can divide up metrics into two general pots, right? You've got your business metrics and then you've got your marketing metrics. A lot of startups kind of confuse these, confuse these two. It's very possible that there is an overlap between depending on your business. Like if you're a SaaS business, some of your marketing metrics may actually be uh, business metrics. But make sure you have a clear division between the two. Because your business metrics are those that will see your business grow, right? So here we're talking, we're talking revenue, we're talking um, your ROI, we're talking customer retention, we're talking, and this is where the overlap begins. We're talking uh, the number of customers, uh, we're talking acquisition, we're talking number of customers who are uh, abandoning or lapsing. Um, you've got your financial metrics, but you've also got your internal sort of what we call the logistic and operational metrics, right? So you don't forget to, to a lot of uh, startups as they continue to grow, they come, their culture completely changes. Think about how you're measuring that element of your business as well. You know, what is your, just like we're looking at, we, we must look at customer satisfaction, look at employee satisfaction as well. Have some metrics around that. Have some metrics around time spent on, in, on projects, both internal projects and projects that you're delivering outside. Think about metrics around that. From a marketing point of view, um, and this ties into what Paul was saying about how startups sometimes don't have KPIs. I'd kind of extend, extend that and say those start, some startups have KPIs, they're just the wrong KPIs, right? So marketing KPIs should really revolve around what is going to make my bank balance grow. So when I get my next statement, I want that number at the bottom to be much higher this month than it was last month. Yeah. So what are the levers I have? Right? What, what are the things I can do for that to happen? Okay, well, for that to happen, I can charge more. Right. So you can start to look at your 
uh, revenue per customer. Okay, well, I could increase the number of customers I have at the same price. So now you're looking at acquisition. You can keep customers around for longer. Now I'm looking at retention. See, these are the sort of, this is the way to look at KPIs. And often people see KPIs as a, as a forecard of well or not. And that's not what a, that's not what a mm. KP, set of KPIs is. KPIs is a really useful tool to really understand the buttons and the levers that you have to play with within the business to finally make that revenue figure grow. But it's really going to revolve around, uh, and then, and yeah, so when you've got your marketing numbers, then you can look at your campaign numbers that sits on top of that. So first layer is business metrics. Next layer is marketing metrics. And the layer above that is your campaign metrics. These are, this is how you measure all the individual activities that you do. And how, how are you going to know what, what KPIs to choose? Well, what is the end objective of that? If it is an acquisition campaign, what are the levers that you have to make people to, to acquire more customers? Is it a retention-based campaign? What are the levers that you have to keep people sticking around for longer. And that's how you define the campaign KPIs. So KPI isn't some, KPIs is not data, right? It's numbers, but you know, we, we, it's often kind of given to the data guy to kind of work out the KPIs. Define. It's actually very basic common sense when you kind of break it down and, and logical when you say, well, it's just a way of being able to, 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 to measure the, um, the different, the different tools I have to play with, the different things I can do. And when you see KPIs that way, it makes it a lot easier to work out what they are. I think if anyone's ever worked for an agency or a corporate, you will have sat through these horrendous agency presentations that happen once a month, once a quarter. Oh, calm down. Well, meet... that, was my, that was my life. <laughs> that was my life for many, many years. I remember, um, you know, one of the media agencies, they'd always have a 110 page media wash up and they'd have every single ad and, you know, who clicked on what ads and where they got to and what the, you know, the engagement rate and click through rate. And then the digital agency would stand up and they'd have like 30 you know, slides on, on their pages and you know, which page performed well and what looked nice and you know, problems they solved. Then you'd have the email agency and the CRM agency. And yes, that is a very large corporate way of doing things, but none of the numbers actually mattered because no one knew what the relationship was between all these numbers. And if you're running a business and you're looking at profitability, you're looking at revenue, you're looking at... Um, the types of clients that are going to grow and scale your business, you need to have that integrated view. And I think the, the one thing that, um, that got, got me completely hooked with Ryan is in his, um, and I remember that I remember the Excel almost line by line. It's like, there is, I think 8% and there was a, a live case study he showed me, but 8% of customers were coming through from one ad and that might look really marginal because the other ads were outperforming, but those 8%, I think we're, we're bringing to like 40 or 50 percent more revenue and more profitability and so those eight percent of ads or ten percent of ads whatever the numbers were would be the ones that would probably be switched off by the media agency they were mm. the ones that were literally driving that business um and so i think everyone can and should fall in love with data and i think that pragmatism that we always talk about when you've got four or five core kpis suddenly if you can if you can translate all these numbers and dashboards and geekery into three or four things that people in the business can hold on to suddenly you get a culture of people loving data of seeing the impact of their work and that's where everything changes mm. yeah um i think the relation between metrics is super important and um to also like align it in a funnel view is what we do like in our dashboard we have like a clear funnel top to bottom wherever those metrics are aligned and i think that is definitely what helps us although there's like some marketers out there like hubspot i uh, keep saying um funnels are dead <laughs> but our view is um funnels and, and dashboards are super important and we have um about i think we have eight key metrics eight kpi that we look at every month on this dashboard so look, i think so I, 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 i'm with i'm i sort of see what hubspot are saying here right yeah look, the, what what are all of these things what is a funnel a funnel is just a way of being able to to simplify an otherwise very complex situation that that's what this is that's what a funnel is right it's a very complex situation to try and understand the mindset of someone and kind of uh what stage of the journey they're on and it's it's just a simplification of that and with that comes uh concessions right because we're simplifying a, a complex world we have to make concessions somewhere so I mean, we're not going to go into into that, but they, I think they've got a they they use more of a pinwheel type model. Which, uh, <laughs> yes, flywheel. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Which 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 
I, I would advise everyone to look into, right? Because even if you don't adopt that method, it, it's based on some very, very sound principles. But um, the, the, reason we, the reason we use the funnel is it is very, very logical, right? And even though it's a very complex world, it, we're trying to basically capture the, the, the most amount of people as we possibly can. Um, you can basically, and it, if that's the way that works for it, because it aligns with the way people think, right? People think in a very linear fashion. If that's the way that works for that particular startup, optimizing the funnel can basically bring the vast majority of the value that the startup or a company or any yeah. company is, is looking for. So, but, but there is value in looking at other models and, uh, it, and, and, and these, these things are changing all the time. This time in two or three years, there'll be another way of looking at yeah. what you marketing. I think di diagrammatically funnels look like that. I think people are very complicated beasts. They never work in the way that a funnel wants to. I'm, tr I'm trying in my head to throw out an analogy of, of COVID and funnels, because if you think about people catching COVID um, and you think about, you know, if you catch a Corona, try and work out who gave it to you and all of the different touch points that you had with, with people. And then you've got millions of people flowing around, some of it whom have it, some of whom don't. It's kind of like a big marketing funnel when you start to get those numbers and then trying to understand all of those touch points and who did what. I'll work on the analogy next. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll do a podcast just on it when it's clear in my head. But that's the complexity that you're dealing with. So I think when you start thinking about your marketing, thinking about it diagram diagrammatically helps. But the reality is that, that people aren't linear and your 100 customers don't go down to 80 buyers and they go down to um, to repeat purchases. And, and and the funnel also, sorry, Chris, you, you've got us talking about funnels and like that's just, yeah. that's just, that that's uh, that's a pet podcast by itself. But Funnels only really optimize the journey of one set of people, the majority of people. But for any business, the majority could even just be maybe 20, 30 to 40 percent. And the remainder come from all other directions. So when we talk about the customer funnel, what we should really be talking about is customer funnels with an S, right? Mm -hmm. And every business needs to be thinking about multiple different funnels, multiple different ways that they're that, that they're um, they bring customers in. So no, no business that I've ever come across has only one funnel, although it's only one funnel that they ever try and optimize. Yeah, very good point. I have this almost like a final question now. Um, it's around people who want to learn growth hacking or want to get into growth hacking. There's so much information out there. There's Neil Patel posting a blog post a day. There's HubSpot posting probably two blog posts a day. How would they start? Where would they start? Hmm. Look, I mean, look, all, all of this stuff is good. Yeah, absolutely. Read, read Neil Patel's stuff. I really like Neil Patel's stuff. Uh, but I think, uh, and, and there, there's so many others, right? Um, but the reality is, is that you need to understand the basic principles, right? This is just how other people are applying them, applying the principles. So Neil Patel will often uh, sort of talk about the, the, the things that work, but that, that, that worked for him. Um, in that particular instance, in that particular scenario, it does not mean that you can pick up that strategy and apply it for yourself. Understand the very, very basic principles. You don't need data. You don't need to be a marketer. You just need very, very basic logical sense, right? That I have people who don't know about my product. I want them to buy my product. I'm taking them on this journey and it's working like this. So, you know, this is how it's working. This is the current situation as it stands. I want to improve this. Well, logically, you don't want to mess up the business by stopping activity. So let me just take a little bit of money away and start doing something else with it and see what happens. You know, like I, I heard a really good quote that uh, failure is just an experiment that lasted too long. And I love that. Right. That's kind of that's kind of what, you know, for me, that's the perfect definition of failure. So we that's what that's what we are trying to prevent here. Right. So that's the mindset that you really need. Yeah. Anyone who wants to learn growth hacking needs to take away. Now, all you're doing is you're taking that bit of money away, running experiments to kind of make sure that what you're currently doing is working better. How do you run experiments? Okay, well, number one, all the, you find the right tools because that's the kind of mindset that you've got, right? You annoy a lot of people to try and get you to, 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 to get your way as to, to do what you want to do. And, and believe me, that takes a certain personality to do as well, right? So if you have that, that slight level of, I don't want to use annoying because that's a reflection on me myself, but like that you have that slight kind of ability to persuade people to your way of thinking, that's going to be really vital. 
Um, but basically, you, it, you, you, you run an alternative scenario and see what happens. That's, that's the basic principle. The way to start doing this is launch a Squarespace website and do it for yourself. I think if you're com coming at this completely from scratch, if you're maybe more in a corporate type environment, in an agency type environment, like to kind of apply these kind of this thinking within your uh, within a, a larger organization, you need to create a business case. You need to be able to show uh, on an Excel spreadsheet what happens if the company was to give you ten percent of the budget and you were to get a 0.1% uplift, what does that mean for the final number? If you were to get a 0.2% of uplift, what does that mean? If you were to be able to get a 10% uplift, what does that mean? Mm. And that's the way to really start to entice a larger organization into doing this. Um, I don't mean to make this sound easy, but or, or but the, the the basic principles of growth hacking for the right right mindset are very, very straightforward to understand. The difficult part comes in in trying to convince others in your vision. And that's uh, a skill that we have we have kind of honed in on and are continuing to hone in on. We're nowhere near perfect here and no one is, but it's really tough. All other materials that you're reading online are interesting. Take inspiration from that. But but that I think that's kind of all it is, is inspiration. I think, yeah, I'd I'd agree that it depends it depends who you are and where you are. I think if you're wanting to start a business tomorrow and you don't have one, um, first one I would do is just do a survey and interview people about your idea because actually just surveying 100 people either online or your friends you can start to see the difference that numbers make between you know 60 percent 40 percent 20 percent of people would buy your wizzy maju um gadget and actually when people first see numbers and their intentions to buy or choose or do something that that immediately gives people more insight about what the, what they want to do the second one um look at case studies so if you think about um, Four Sigmatic Coffee, um, our sponsor of the show, uh, Great Coffee. Um, if you if you if you look at their their um, web page, for me, it's a perfect example of someone that's understood customer insight, the challenges that people would buy to buy a product they haven't bought before, and they're very good at all the persuaders to try and get people to the next step of the the funnel. To me, they're best in class. If you then compare them to any other company that's trying to sell a different type of coffee online, you can start to, in your head, understand, okay, this would persuade me, that wouldn't. These guys' websites isn't, doesn't quite work, or they haven't mm -hmm. thought about this, or there are questions outstanding. And you can start to think about that, that marketing conversion process. Um, so look at case studies, look at case studies where people have growth hacked or changed the success of another business, because you can see how they attack the business. I think um, Sean Ellis has done some great podcasts and interviews. Um, look at the stuff that he did for Dropbox, look at the fundamental questions that he asked businesses and, and ask those same questions of yourself or the business that you're working on. And then I think I would start looking at a business performance metric first, marketing, conversion, repurchase, process, bums on seat, operational cross, profitability, map out that first. And then you can start to see where the black holes in the business are. And then you can start to really go, okay, if, you know, if I'm spending far too much money on resource, what would happen if I outsource some of that? What would happen if I if I change the process? Do I need that salesperson? Could we digitize that? And um, that's where I would start. Yeah. Okay. So finally, I wanted to ask you. Um. Obviously, this year has been quite challenging for, I think, probably all of us. What is next for Grow Studio? What type of projects and what kind of exciting things are coming up for you? Yeah, thank you so much. Well, the very first thing that we're doing is um, we're rebranding the entire business, which is something that uh, we're really excited about. I remember when I think it was Nude Espresso in Shoreditch uh, one lunchtime that I kind of pulled together a very you know bizarre color scheme and I kind of planned the logo. And the only thing I wanted for the logo was, you know, because we're gross, you know, we don't want to leaf right in maybe like being held by a hand or something, you know, one of the, a typical leaf. Um, but the, the the branding has been existed since 2014. We're rebranding, and the, one of the reasons we're rebranding is um, we're we're really really fortunate that to have been a high growth company ourselves. Um, from fundamentally one guy in uh, a baseball cap uh, in a shared office to you know like we're, we're we're a global business now. You know we're we're we have presence and we have footprint in, in a number of places across the Middle East. Uh, Qatar is uh, where we're going next. Uh, 
Um, we're we're back in Dubai. Um, touch wood if current if the coronavirus um, kind of Excellent. allows us to in a couple of weeks, uh, where we do a lot of work in the USA, a lot of work in Europe, and we're in a, in a really fortunate position now where we can start to say, look around and say, look, this is all the things that we do. We can now decide where we want to go because as, just like many other startups, we kind of had our fingers many. And where we shine best, where we shine best is in go to market. So, and in helping new products and new technologies and new propositions go from development all the way through to validation, to launching all the way through to even potentially getting funding, depending on, on the company. That's our sweet spot. And where we've really got a lot of attention is not only working with startups themselves, but doing this for corporates who, who are now very much looking at new ways of doing business, new business models. So we're, we're probably taking the business or you'll, what you'll find is that you'll, we're taking the business in the direction of, of um, helping companies launch these new business models, helping startups launch new products. Um, but for organizations who are larger than the startup than, than themselves, so VCs and for corporates and for um, potentially accelerated programs as well. Uh, we're, we're really excited about that because as much as we are corporate guys and we've always been corporate guys, um, we're consultants through and through. The, our best work is always done with the entrepreneur and uh, the best numbers kind of come from the, mo the more agile of businesses, which is a startup. Mm -hmm. So being able to do that for corporates and for VCs and for larger companies is just hugely exciting for us. So watch this space, I guess. <laughs> So I guess uh, the next website, growthstudio.com, is going to break the internet. Oh, don't advertise <laughs> a website right now. It's really yeah. bad. Like, it's a really bad website. I'm not a developer at all, right? But I, th I think I've got a reasonable creative eye. But um, uh, that that's, that's one weekend's yeah. worth of work, which, by the way, happened. Just a quick story. One time, Paul and I were in the office, and I was like, Paul, I want to... I'm going to sort the website out, right? I'm going to basically do this. Enough is enough. We're going to fix this. Uh, an hour later, uh, with my sort of tail between one of my legs, I kind of had to admit that I deleted our entire website, our entire WordPress. Everything was gone. So so the website, you, if you do go to a website, uh, then just do realize that was one weekend's and yeah. worth work, a lot of coffee and no sleep. Uh, but watch this space for our brand new branding, which is being done in Sweden at the moment. So uh, really happy with that. Otherwise, you know who to ask for websites. Well, this is it. I thought this this might be don't actually. Going, but... You got anyone, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but we we do we do need a um, a tool that that allows people who are interested to kind of leave us uh, their details. Maybe for us to generate some leads. So if you know a good lead gen app, then do let us know. Okay, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Um, okay, then yeah, I think thanks so much for coming on the show today. Um, has been really a pleasure to speak to you and for sharing thanks for sharing all your experience and insight into so many different types of businesses startups and corporates so really enjoyed this and looking forward to looking forward to do more together soon wonderful thank you so much for having us and if you turn around and look to see exactly where that little wooden desk is chris the wooden uh, chest of drawers the other side that used to be my desk right yeah, yeah. there. So I think you're in, in Moorgate at the moment, aren't you? I'm in Moorgate, yeah, in the, in the meeting room, yeah. And I can see my old desk right behind you. So that's interesting as well. Right. Yeah. I'll, right, I'll right. check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Good. Perfect. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Cheers, guys. See you okay. later now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.